Is Cardano fundamentally flawed? Does the smart contract concurrency issue expose a significant design defect in Cardano? In this video, I'm going to explain in simple terms why the answer to both of these questions is simply no. But also by the end of this video, you'll understand why this is also actually a significant advantage for Cardano. But hello everybody, this is Brandon with Crypto Trades and Tech. And since Cardano is a project that we've followed very closely on this channel since 2020, I wanted to give an update here. 2021 was an exciting year. Multiple hard fork upgrades throughout 2021 culminating in the Alonzo hard fork that finally brought smart contract functionality. Now, of course, with that smart contract rollout, there were some issues that caused a lot of concern among uh, the community and, and many who were uh, watching the project. But before we get rolling, my standard disclaimer here, I'm not a licensed financial advisor, nor am I a riverfront real estate expert. So please don't buy or sell anything that you hear me discuss today without first doing your own research. And if you do end up losing all of your money, you're gonna have to find somebody else to help you find a rental spot for your van. Uh, for the issue at hand, we can distill the issues down to really the pros and cons of two major accounting models. On one hand, we have the legacy well-known accounting model used by Bitcoin, or the UTXO, the Unspent Transaction Output Model. Now, this has been extended by the Cardano team and is now called E-UTXO, or Extended UTXO. And in the other corner, we have the accounting model, which is popularized by Ethereum, and is what virtually all smart contracts in use are built on today. Now, before I explain, let's recap Cardano's history here briefly. Now, Cardano began development in 2015 and was launched in 2017 by Charles Hoskinson. Now, Charles was co-founder of Ethereum, but left after disputes with Vitalik Buterin. And after leaving Ethereum, Charles co-founded IOHK, or Input Output Hong Kong, which is a blockchain engineering company whose primary business is the development of Cardano, along with two other organizations, the Cardano Foundation and Emergo. Now, the platform itself is named after, and I apologize, I always get his name wrong, but Gerolamo Cardano, who was one of the most influential mathematicians of the Renaissance. Now, the currency itself is named after Ada Lovelace, who was often regarded as one of the first computer programmers for her work on Charles Babbage's proposed general purpose computer, or also known as the analytic engine. Now, she was one of the first to recognize that this machine was capable of much more than routine calculation. Now, fun fact, much like there are 100 million Satoshis per Bitcoin, one ADA contains 1 million Lovelaces. Okay, so what even is concurrency? In computer science technical terms, concurrency refers to the decomposability of a program, algorithm, or problem into order-independent, or partially ordered components or units of computation. Now, that's quite the mouthful. Simply put, it's the ability for different parts of a program to be executed out of order without affecting the final outcome. This allows for parallel execution of different states or different units, which can improve overall speed and efficiency. In the world of cryptocurrencies, we can better understand concurrency, especially when it comes to smart contracts, as the ability for several different unique agents or users to interact with the same contract at the same time. So let's start by examining Ethereum's account-based model and how it works in relation to smart contracts. It's important to understand that the state of each block is not stored uh, in the blocks being mined, but rather it's stored in the nodes locally, which then come to an agreement by comparing what's called the state root or the overall state of the system. Now, the Ethereum virtual machine interprets transactions as events and determines the state transition outcome for these events based on the previous state. So it's a state transition. This makes developer abstraction much easier and facilitates the construction of many dApps such as Uniswap, Aave, Curve, etc. Now, interestingly, on Ethereum, smart contracts are concurrent because of this state transition property, but the actual transactions recorded in the blockchain itself are still sequ sequential or non-concurrent, meaning that when different users are accessing a DEX, for example, to exchange pairs of tokens, 
The miner will still sequentially order these transactions as they are packed into blocks. Now on Cardano, on the other hand, there is no global state or Cardano virtual machine like there is in Ethereum. So the issue of, of smart contract concurrency is really not an apples to apples comparison. Because with Cardano, uh, the contracts themselves are components of the UTXO, which is essentially act as conditions to govern how a unspent transaction will be used. Now developers are then faced with a challenge because only one agent can consume a given UTXO or a given address, therefore one contract at a time, which then creates this so-called concurrency problem. Now, to understand the myriad of potential solutions that are being proposed, it's important to understand that a single transaction on Cardano can have multiple inputs and outputs, as you see highlighted here in this tweet. Interestingly, uh, EUTXO actually allows for more parallel parallelism of transactions on-chain versus the accounting model. It's just that the limitations really are in different places. On Ethereum, the issue is more on the back end on writing transactions to the blockchain itself, which is reflected in high gas fees when block space is at a premium. Whereas on Cardano, the limitations are really on the front end, so to say, with the number of independent actors that can interoperate with a contract at the same time. So given that native to the Cardano blockchain, there's actually a quite a bit of concurrency or the ability to do multiple transactions in the same transaction as it gets recorded on the blockchain, uh, there is almost an unlimited number of ways for developers to solve the challenges on the front end then with the concurrency issue when interacting with smart contracts. Now for the sake of time, we're not going to delve into specifics of different solutions, uh, but some of the major solutions fall into one of these categories. First is the splitting of UTXOs. And so if only one UTXO state can be consumed per block, well, it can be split into smaller UTXOs and spent at the same time. Then there's batch processing, which is a chain deterministic validation rule where agents outside of the chain can only send to the correct, the correct output. It means that they do all the computation externally and then they ultimately submit the correct output once it's been determined. Deferred updating. Instead of constantly applying updates to the state, it waits until the state is required on the chain. So it waits until the, the finalization of something before it actually records that to the UTXO. Off-chain solutions such as proposed by Ergodex, and there's mutual knowledge systems. This is a very interesting one in which users can interact with dApps in a convenient account-based model, the Ethereum account-based model, uh, but on smart contract capable blockchains using uh, more rigid UTXO models. And this is proposed by Nerveros with their what's called AVOUM, or Account View on UTXO model. So this all seems like a huge headache though, right? So why go through all this trouble when they could have just copied Ethereum's account-based model? Well, the issue is rooted in reliability and security. Billions of dollars in value have been lost due to poor code quality on Ethereum smart contracts. In order to be able to provide as much assurance as possible that smart contracts or any other solution built on the core layer one chain, you need something called determinism. This is where the two models diverge. UTXO is fully deterministic, meaning users can predict off chain or externally to the system how their transactions will affect on chain state of the blockchain. This allows for total predictability for transactions and script processing which avoids issues like unexpected script validation results or failures, unexpected commissions, and unexpected updates to the blockchain or script state. So in the context of, of evaluating potential investments across the cryptocurrency landscape, this is a huge advantage for both Cardano and applications built on Cardano as time goes on. And this is really an underappreciated point. When you look at the thousands of projects vying for attention uh, for an adoption across the, the quickly growing cryptocurrency landscape, only those projects that can stand the test of time, as well as being able to provide something uniquely beneficial to the market, will survive. Now, when it comes to layer one blockchains, I don't think it'll be enough to do just what Ethereum does a little bit faster. If you look at what's coming on Ethereum, do the 
massive network effects Ethereum already has. It'll be hard enough to displace. But when you consider, too, that uh, there's a full Layer 2 ecosystem being built out that provides much a greater scale at much lower cost just for, you, just for moving to those Layer 2 ecosystems, and then you combine that with the performance upgrades that are coming to the base Layer 1 network via sharding and proof of stake in Ethereum 2.0, competing Layer 1 projects will need a lot more differentiation than just being slightly faster now, also, when you look at the universe of applications that are being built on different major blockchains, be it Ethereum, Polkadot, Avalanche, Solana, Elrond, etc., projects that are built with a foundation of determinism and predictable code will further differentiate themselves over time. So, in summary, the supposed concurrency issue on Cardano is not actually an issue at all. In fact, the challenge itself is rooted in one of the most important differentiations between Cardano and the myriad of competitors on the market. Now, given that this channel is crypto trades and tech, we just went over the tech portion. Let's go over the trading portion here. And let's take a look at Cardano's chart and I'll give you a lowdown of what I'm seeing. Now, first of all, we see that Cardano broadly has been in an uptrend, but lately it's been sideways since you know almost a year now, just like Bitcoin. So we wanna use some caution as this asset could be uh, losing momentum but it looks like we've already come off quite a bit from the high. So as of right now, from this peak, we've sold off as much as 60% on Cardano. Now, generally speaking, with an asset that's a, that's a growing cryptocurrency like Cardano, with this growing ecosystem, uh, taking advantage of these opportunities is, is what we want to be doing. Now, I'm going to be highlighting as the year goes on, uh, again, this, this modified, simplified strategy for people that don't want to be very active traders. When we look at this chart, we see the 200-day moving average is definitely in an uptrend. And here we've started to go back down here. So we haven't confirmed that we're going to resume our uptrend. So we don't know how long this downtrend is going to continue. So if you're interested in DCAing or dollar cost averaging into Bitcoin, Bitcoin, sorry, Cardano, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to wait for confirmation that the market is recovering. Now, as we layer in the solution, generally speaking, I say when the 200 day moving average is trending down like this, you wanna suspend your DCA activity. However, let's put a qualifier on this. Let's go ahead and measure. We are 40% under the 200 day moving average after it had a very strong uptrend. So if you're more active about trading, you can, you can do worse than trying to trade a bounce back to the 200 day moving average. We should, price should find a move back up toward that area. That would be a 50, percent move from a low of 118 back up to say 183. However, I don't want to depend on that. Uh, what I would rather do is you see here we had this downtrend between these this point here, this, this high that we put in in November and then this high that we put in uh, late December. When we break the upside of this downtrend, it might be a good opportunity to look at taking an initial position. And what we can do is really watch the 50 day moving average. So Broadly, the 200-day moving average has been in an uptrend and it's settling off here, it's leveling off here. Given the separation that we are beneath it, we can probably try to make a play at a bounce play here. But what we're gonna wanna wait for is we really wanna wait for confirmation that we have momentum back on our side. So let's wait for the 50-day moving average, I would say. So we're gonna be coming into that very soon here. You see that touch right there, it hit the 50-day moving average and then it was initially rejected by it. What we're gonna wanna do is we're gonna wait, wait and want to wait for price to close above the 50 day moving average a couple of days, just like this right here. And then maybe you can take a, a position there. These are not financial advice, just throwing out some ideas here. Now, without the help of the moving averages, more broadly, what I see on the chart is, if we take away a lot of these moving averages and our and our trends, we see a sub area of support here. So we have a pretty strong area of support. Now, so if you're more of an active trader, Trying to build a position if you're a longer term trader, but still a trader, building a position when you come into areas of support like this, probably not a bad idea. You also know quickly where you're wrong. If you were to lose a dollar on Cardano, if it, if it goes below a dollar, it's probably going to come back down to find areas of lower support. But as you can see here, it's lost a dollar a few times, but very quick and short and recovers very quickly. Those are pretty easy to identify that as a, as a fake out. But what we're looking for is for it to close below that area on a daily closing basis and retest it and then show some resumption downward or multiple daily closes below it 
would also give us an indication that there's a problem. So for me, what I've been doing is I've been adding not very aggressive small positions here on this little support area that we're, we're starting to build up here. As we come into this area of support, I'm starting to build positions myself knowing that I'll be wrong if we get below this area. Um, so currently I'm buying at the top end of this range. And if we drop further into the range, I will add to my position all the way down until we show that we're losing this range. And this is a slow accumulation. Uh, for me, this is how I'm doing it. Now, again, uh, knowing I'm below the 200 day moving average, I will be very conscientious to exit here. This strategy about accumulating when the 200 day moving average is in an uptrend, but uh, like with that right there, when the 200 day moving average is in an uptrend and price drops below it, that's when you want to accumulate because the odds that you're going to have a strong bounce back are pretty good. And then we're also going to be trading around the, two, the 50 day moving average. So this is your opportunity over here within reason uh, once we lose the 50 day moving average to trim those positions. So you would have added here and there and maybe trim some there. And now you're looking at where you want to buy back. So just like we watch also on the upside when the price disconnects from the 200 day moving average. So from the 200 day moving average to here was a 235% disconnect measured from bottom up. That's how far away uh, from the 200 day moving average price was then 100% disconnect. These are a very overbought territory. And so price is inevitably going to come back down and find lower support. So in my opinion, this is probably a decent area to accumulate, but what we don't know is if we're going to see prolonged downside crypto wide. So it would be no fault of Cardano per se, but the entire crypto market could have some downside ahead of it. So if you are taking positions here, you're going to want to know quickly where you're wrong and exit before you have to endure months or potentially even possibly years of pain uh, waiting for these assets to recover. If you made it this far, thank you so much for the support. Please like and subscribe. Consider sharing this video with a friend if you find it useful. And I appreciate any comments below as well. Any thoughts you have, any follow-ups you'd like to see me do. Have a good one, everybody. Take care.